folks, this is Pastor Mike Hargard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchmen video broadcast. As Watchmen, we're watching for we're watching for the danger to come. We're watching for the day of the Lord so that we can blow the trumpet and warn people that the days are drawing near when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And I'm looking forward to that day, and I hope that you are looking forward to that day too. But there are dangers that lie ahead, and things that we should be able to clearly see if we will just follow the scriptures. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to follow the scriptures. And I was thinking about uh, the first place that I'm going to go to in the scriptures. Uh, I, a lot of you know, if, when I study the Bible, um, God gives me a word, or I look for a word or a phrase in the scriptures. The Bible says, preach the word. And one of the best ways that, uh, for me that I have found to preach the gospel, and to preach the scriptures, and to teach them, is just follow the trail of words that God leaves us all throughout the scriptures. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about corruption today. And the first place that I find that word is back in the book of Genesis. But I want to, I want to sort of head into that by going to Matthew chapter 24. Here in my King James Bible, uh, Matthew 24 verse 36. Now you know the Bible here. Jesus is talking about what is going to happen in the last days. What probably a lot of these things have already happened on a small scale throughout history. Now we're going to see them on a grand scale. Now we're going to see in the last days the total fruition of everything that Jesus said word for word because he said in verse 35, heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away. That's like reason four billion and one why I believe that this is the inerrant, inspired word of God. He said that his words would never pass away. When you, when you take that statement and, and match it up against what a lot of the current theologians, what a lot of, uh, let me get my Niv Bible here, what a lot of the new Bible scholars say. The new Bi Bible scholars say, well, of course, there's differences in the translation. That's because everybody knows that there has been corruption in the manuscripts from the time that the original writers wrote them down until now. You see, most, most of Christianity today, if it's based on something other than the idea that the Bible right now, today, is the inerrant Word of God. Most of Christianity today is based upon the idea that the Bible itself has been corrupted over the years. You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Well, let me just show you one of the places where it is. Uh, let's see here. Let's go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter, now we deal with this in a video that we have called Which Bible? And uh, if you want a copy of that, we'll get it to you. <clears throat> and I show you dozens of places, and there are more than dozens of places where the new modern translations omit portions of verses or entire verses altogether. 1 John 5, 7, see I don't have to turn there in this one because I know it. 1 John 5, 7 in the King James Bible says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I believe that. I believe that that's the Word of God. I believe that's the doctrine of God. And I don't believe that, that the Roman Catholic Church or anybody else added that. I believe that it's the inspired Word of God. 1 John 5, 7, out of the NIV, reads like this. They took it out. They omitted it. It's not there. <clears throat> they had this idea <clears throat> that the Bibles that we have have the New American Standard, the NIV. The Bibles we have today is built upon the premise that all of the Bible manuscripts are corrupt. We don't really know what the Word of God really originally said. We're just going to have to guess, and we might even make some stuff up along the way to sort of, you know, fit into the current theological thought. And yet this Bible right here says, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And so do I believe the scholars who say we don't have all the Bible 
Or do I believe Jesus who said, you will always have every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So I believe that. And then he said, then he said, verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not, until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's interesting <clears throat> that he associates the preservation of his word and that idea with the idea of as it was in the days of Noah. Because when we start looking for teachings from the Bible about corruption, and, and you understand this, don't you? Okay, You understand this. You get up in the middle of the night and you have this fierce hunger. You walk into your kitchen, you open the refrigerator door because you remembered, you're laying there in bed and you remembered something that was in the refrigerator that all of a sudden it just, it just sounds really good and you think, you know what, I'm going to put that in my belly. You go to the refrigerator, you open it up. And there is a field of bacteria and mold all over the top of this dish. It's been in there for who knows how long. And you look at that and you go and you smell it and it stinks and it looks bad and there's nothing about it. And you know that if you were to taste this thing and actually put it in your stomach, it would come right back up. You see, that's corruption. That's corruption. We know the difference between Fresh cooked food and corrupt food. It looks bad, it smells bad, it tastes bad. Everything that is corrupt in this world, God designed it so that we would know the difference. Dogs, dogs don't care. They eat fresh meat just as much as they would eat corrupt meat. They don't care. Some buzzards and things like that, vultures, they don't care how rotten it is. Crows, you see them on the side of the road picking up roadkill, they don't care. But God designed us to not only know the difference between what was uncorrupted and what is corrupted, to not only know the difference, but he designed us to care whether or not we actually partake of it. And I want you to think about that. Think about how, think about how simple God makes things for us. And we're going to deal with themes of corruption in the Bible. And I've got three news articles that have been sent to me over the last couple of weeks that they should startle you. But the problem is we've seen all of this too many times. Let's go back to the days of Noah, Genesis chapter 6. What was it? that made God finally... To, what was it when you went to the refrigerator, opened the door, my wife does this every now and then, and, and you probably are, are the same way in your household as mine. you got some fresh stuff in there. You've got vegetables down in that little crisper down on the bottom. I don't, I don't think it's much of a crisper. It's more of like a, a slime building machine because you put fresh vegetables down in, the, in that bottom drawer in there and then you, finally when you decide, you know what, I want some celery and I want some carrots and I want some bell peppers and you pull thing that out and the thing is just, oh, oh, it's terrible. Okay? You finally, you say, you know what, can't use this anymore. It's not good. I mean, you know, maybe it's in there a few days and maybe you can throw it into a little stir fry or a stew or something like that and just, you know, it's, it's okay for that. But after a certain point, it just becomes so corrupt that you have to throw it out. You say, I can't use it anymore. See how it works? God got to that point in the days of Noah. Genesis chapter 6, verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. God is the one who decided that it was corrupt. He made the decision. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. I want you to notice in this verse, in between verses 11 and 12, we had the word corrupt here. One, two, three times in this passage. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are the things that are corrupt in this world. And I'll tell you, it, it always starts out in, the, in this world, in the things of this world, 
things always start out good or they start out as a good idea or something that has some benefit to it. But the very nature of everything in this world is that even if it started out good, let's say your grandma made you, and I really like this, a coconut cream pie, home-baked coconut cream pie. Brought that to you, you put that in the refrigerator, it's the best thing in the world. And then it sits in there for, I don't know, two or three weeks, and it's no good. And everything in that refrigerator, even the things that are in the freezer, over time is going to corrupt. Everything in this world, though it starts out good, ends up being corrupt unless it can be preserved somehow, some way. But here in the world, everything was corrupt. And God had gotten to that point where he said, you know what? They're, they were corrupting more and more and more. Maybe I could do something with them. Noah preached to them in the days when the ark was a preparing. But finally, God got to the point and he said, I can't do anything anymore. I have to throw this out. We have to start all over again. And that is exactly what he did. And Jesus is pointing that out to us because in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Noah, this is how it's happening right now. Are we to the point in this world, are we to the point where God finally says, Okay, this is the line. Everybody's crossed the line. The world has crossed the line. Can't do anything with them anymore. Are we to that point yet? I, I don't think we're there yet. But I think we're very close. So let's think about this idea of corruption. In, in, uh, in the land of Egypt, when the Israelites were there and they were being held in bondage, I want you to notice one of the things that God sent as a plague to the land of Egypt because of their corruption. Exodus chapter 8, verse 23. God said, And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And the Lord did so, and there came a grievous swarm of flies into the house of Pharaoh, and into his servants' houses, and into all the land of Egypt. The land, listen to this now, the land was corrupted by reason of the swarm of flies. And I want you, there's so many things to think about here in this, but I want us to look at this again. Notice that number one, let me do this here, okay? Here is the NIV. And you'll see why I'm doing it this way here in a little bit. There's another place in the Bible that talk about flies. And, and, and think about this, okay? Things that fly in the Bible or have wings are indicative of spirits, devils, fallen angels. God, listen to this now, in Exodus chapter 8. This is a prefiguring of what is going to happen in the last days. God is going to unleash hell, literally, on the earth. Revelation chapter 9, the pit's going to be opened up. And here you have these scorpions and locusts. Locusts have wings. Okay? And they fly out of the bottomless pit. These are devils. These are angels that left their first estate. They're locked inside the pit. And then there's angels that are cast down from heaven in Revelation chapter 12. And we see this. And so here, these flies represent devils that God is holding back right now. But one of these days, God's going to say, have at it. Just like he did with the days of Noah. So anyway, so here we have an unleashing of devil spirits upon planet earth. That's what this is a prophecy of. And notice that God has put a division. I like this. God has put a division between his people and Egypt. And I want you to notice that there is corruption in Egypt. But there is no corruption amongst God's people. And so I have two Bibles here. One, I don't declare... Because, you know, Mike Hoggard, big deal. It's not what I say about the King James Bible. It's what the King James Bible says about itself. This King James Bible, I'm going to turn here. I'm going to show it to you. This King James Bible says in Psalm 12, and say I had this one memorized too, that the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this. See that word preserve? That's the opposite of corrupt. Thou shalt preserve them, O Lord. Thou shalt, or thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. 
Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And so this Bible declares itself to be incorrupt and preserved and not um, the Bible talks about the, how Jesus lay in the tomb for two days. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years, so think about two thousand years. And God did not allow the body, which is his word, to corrupt for two days. He did not let his holy one. Well, I like this because on the front of it, it says holy Bible. God did not allow his holy one to see corruption. That's what this Bible declares about itself. This Bible here doesn't say it that way. This is the NIV, Psalm 12. The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. They took out the doctrine of the incorruptibility of the Word of God. <clears throat> and so clearly, clearly there's, there's a division. These people who follow this book are divided from those who follow this one. I'm just telling you how it is. You asking me? I'm on this side. I'll follow the, the Bible that declares of itself that it is incorrupt. <clears throat> so anyway, back to Egypt. God put a division and uh, then he gave them a sign. A grievous swarm of flies were coming, and the land was corrupted by reason of the flies. I want you to think of these devils. Think of these flies as devils, as fallen angels, as devil spirits that God is going to unleash on planet Earth. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 1. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking Savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. And I want you to think about this. <clears throat> the Bible is the ointment. It's the balm of Gilead. It's the soothing ointment of the apothecary. Who's the apothecary? The apothecary is the great healer, Jesus Christ. Even in the book of Psalms it says he sent his word and healed him. The greatest gift of healing that God has unleashed on planet earth is not delivering somebody from back pain. The greatest gift of healing that God has unleashed on planet earth is this gift of this Bible that comes in and heals, and I believe in physical healing, but I believe in something greater than that. It heals our soul and gives us immortality and eternal life. Once we're healed that way, we're healed forever. See, you get healed in your physical body, you're still going to die. You know, I'll take it if it comes, <clears throat> but I would rather have my soul healed and given eternal life and immortality than anything else in the world. So this Bible is the ointment of the apothecary. It's the healing balm that soothes our soul. If you talk to me and you're in some kind of trouble or you're feeling down or depressed or something not right, or, or even if you're in sin... I'll tell you, I'm going to give you, I'm going to write you, be like a doctor. I'm going to write a prescription. I'm going to give you three chapters to read per day out of the book of Psalms and probably even the book of Proverbs. Why? Because I think Psalms is like the medicine cabinet for God's people. You go there, you take the medicine, you read what's in there, God will heal your soul. There are other places just as good, but I just like the Psalms for that. Every part of the Bible is designed for a different reason. And the Psalms seem to be the medicine cabinet for God's people who need that healing. That's where I go to for my help when I'm in, when I'm in my, my need. And so here is the ointment of the apothecary. And here's what happens. God is releasing flies, devils. Think of what Paul said. They're going to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So we see doctrines of devils moving in now to the Bible translations, corrupting the very Word of God itself. And it causes the ointment of the apothecary, which at one time smelled good because it was made of herbs and it was made out of good things from the ground that God grew. See, I, I believe in that. But what happens is you find flies in the ointment. Fly in the, flies in the ointment of the apothecary. And it corrupts it. A stinking savor 
See, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put anything, I wouldn't rub anything on my wrist for arthritis or anything like that. That that smelled like rotting, corrupted, dead things. I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, put a little, put a little Ben Gay or icy hot on your joints, and it just kind of smells. It smells like medicine. It smells like what it's but but you wouldn't put anything that's smelled like a rotten dog laying out in the in the sun. Would no, you wouldn't do that. And so what happens is the devils come in and they take the pure doctrines of the Word of God, which give us healing, and they corrupt it. So now, now it stinks. And the corruption is moving in right now. Let's go to Exodus chapter 32. <clears throat> the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go, get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Where is this taking place? This is at the base of Mount Sinai. God has given Moses the Ten Commandments. The people have met with God in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. And <clears throat> God gave them the Ten Commandments with his voice. And then he called Moses up into, the, up into the mountain. And God wrote them with his own hand on two tablets of stone. But while Moses was up there, the people corrupted themselves. When Jesus left, he went up, he went up to heaven. And while he's been there... The pure doctrines that he left behind with his words, the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles have been corrupted over time and the church has corrupted itself. So they have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way. Think about that. Which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. What will the corruption do? When, see, the, the pure Bible, the pure Word of God and the pure doctrines of God will cause you to worship the one true God and worship Him in spirit and in truth. When the flies come in and they stink up the ointment of the apothecary and they corrupt the Word of God, what happens is it causes you to no longer worship this God. Uh, let's find him here. Morals and dogma. But this God here. The God with two heads fused into one body. The opposites, light and darkness, ordo ab chao. That's the God that people are being set up <clears throat> to worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Listen to this one. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Stop right here, because I have a story here about a church and a church worship leader. And it's not just one. It's, it's not, I'm not just picking on this guy. Okay, It's a lot of them. A lot of them that are guilty of evil communications. Evil communications, what would that be? Number one, uh, friends that you hang out with that talk the way they do. And you know how they talk. Okay, That's evil communications. Facebook friends that you have. Okay, uh, people that you hang around, people that you listen to, music that you listen to. Did the Beatles and Elvis Presley and the Rolling Stones, we're going way, 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 way back. Did they have a corrupting effect on the American family? Absolutely. The evil communications corrupted the good manners. It happened in America. It's happening in every America. Does Lady Gaga corrupt t teenagers? Yeah, she does. And she is part of the problem. Uh, all these rock and roll stars with their filth coming out of their mouth and, and screaming doctrines of devils and, and lasciviousness pour, just pouring out of them. Those are evil communications. And you say, well, bless God, I listen to country music. <clears throat> really? Uh, go back and, and think of uh, all, I don't know, three or four Conway Twitty songs that you think contradict the, the Ten Commandments. Loretta Lynn, Barbara Mandrell. I mean, that's old school, right? Hank Williams. Country music. And I, I like country style music. I like the style of music. I mean, it's just good folk music. But those lyrics are damnable, and you know it. Okay, and I'll and listen to this. Now it's moving into southern gospel music and contemporary Christian music. 
the evil communications have corrupted. Listen to this now. At what time? What, remember? Remember the, 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 the pie that your grandma made. Okay, that coconut cream pie made by hand. You put it in the fridge. It is a, it is a prize that she has given you and you neglect it. Three weeks later, the spoilers came in and spoiled it. The flies came in and they made it stink and it's no good anymore. It started out good, but evil communications came in. You know what evil communications is? It's words. Words. And so this is why. This is why. When I'm studying the Bible and I hit a, I hit a stump or a pothole and, I, and I'm stumped in the Bible, and I, can, I do not, I do not go and say, now a better translation probably says, or... Now, in the original Greek, you know what it says here in the original Greek? I don't do that. I don't, you know why? Because I got it in my mind that this stuff is evil communications. And I don't want it to corrupt the goodness that God has put into me. I, listen, I don't want anything to corrupt the goodness that God has put into me. So anyway, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many, here it is, which corrupt the word of God. Are you following now my, my flies in the ointment of the apothecary thing? Okay, are you following that? Be not, for we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Here is the ointment of the apothecary. West Cotton Hort showed up in the 1800s, and they were tasked with revising the King James Bible. Sounds good, right? But they had this little note. Of course, they were occultists. Okay, they were having seances, and uh, they were Mary worshipers, so they they weren't saved. And so their evil communications were injected into this new Bible they came up with called the Revised Version. Whereas in the King James, it boldly declared, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. The Revised Version just simply said, A, a young woman will, will have a baby. That's corruption. And they were corrupting the word. of See, this goes all the way back to the days of Paul. Right after the days of Paul, you had the Gnostics rising up. And they, they were the ones, they were the ones, along with the early Catholic Church around AD 300, they were the ones who were already cutting stuff out of the manuscripts, cutting stuff out of the Bible. I don't like that because that says Jesus is God, and we know that's not true. It says Jesus came in the flesh, and we know that. So they were taking all this stuff out of the Bible and leaving all these good manuscripts laying all over the place, these fresh ones, not them old, stale ones that have been preserved, but these new manuscripts now that uh, have all these holes and they have all these corruptions in them. And Paul, Paul knew about it then. They're already corrupting the Word of God. And oh, by the way, they were writing new Gospels. They were writing the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. They were writing the, the Gospel of, uh, of St. Peter and St. Thomas and St. This. and Th They were writing all these other Gospels, which Peter didn't write, and Mary Magdalene didn't write, and Thomas didn't, didn't write these. And Judas, don't forget Judas, who they found a manuscript called the Gospel of Judas, that just doesn't sound right to me. So they were already corrupting the Word of God, and that corruption exists today, thanks to West Cotton Hort. So now, most, most Bible scholars refuse the manuscript line that the King James Bible was built upon in deference to the new manuscripts that was the corrupt manuscripts that had been corrupted ever since Paul's day. That's what this Bible, New King James, or excuse me, NIV, New American Standard, where is my new, here it is, my New King James Bible. I got three of them right here. Corrupt as a summer day is long because they were all three based upon a different line of manuscripts than the King James Bible was based upon. They're corrupting the Word of God. And so watch this now. If you have good communications in your church, out of your pulpit, out of the music you're listening to, and in your daily life, if you have good communications that are incorrupt, they will preserve you. But if you have evil communications that are coming out of corrupt Bibles, New King James, New American Standard, NIV, New English Version, the Holman Standard Version, the Message Bible, and on and on and on it goes. When you have 
when you have evil communications pouring out of these, what do you mean by evil communications? Well, let's say in the King James Bible, it would say that uh, if you die, you'll go to hell if you're lost in your sins. In the New King James, it just says you go to the grave. That's evil communications. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we Christ who was not corrupt, and neither can his words ever be corrupt. We'll get to that part toward the end. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But I fear, lest by any means, watch this now, lest by any means, New, New King James, New American Standard, the Life Application, Great Controversy, Doctrine and Covenants, Pearl of Great Price, Book of Mormon, Morals and Dogma. Does it, Paul said it doesn't matter how it comes, but it will come. I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be from, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he cometh that preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And <clears throat> Paul is saying this. When the corruption comes, we've already seen it in the Old Testament. When the corruption comes, it'll take the incorrupt God that you're worshiping, get him out of the way, <clears throat> and you'll start worshiping Baal, the calf, the, the bull God, okay, the beast. That's who you're going to be worshiping, the idol, I-D-O-L, shepherd that the Old Testament talks about. So when corruption comes up, it changes who God is. Number two, when corruption shows up, it changes how you can come to that God or how you can approach that God or get something from that God. Whereas in this Bible, it is simple. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And what we have represented here, let's bring Marilyn Ferguson in here. Okay? Uh, what you have represented here is mystical, complicated, difficult ways of getting God to do something in your life. Listen to the word faith preachers, including Joyce Myers. Joyce Myers will every now and then say something from the King James, but then she'll say, now, and she uses a lot the Amplified Bible. You know why? Because it'll change what is written in the incorrupted Word of God. And she likes that. Because then it backs up what she's saying, and her doctrine, her doctrine is not simple. You have to work hard to get anything out of God. According to her doctrine, she has removed countless millions of people from the simplicity that is in Christ and is setting them up. Here we go. Number one, to receive another spirit. Number two, another gospel. And Paul said, whoever brings that gospel, let them be accursed. Another gospel, that other gospel won't give you eternal life. It'll damn you to hell. And another Jesus, another Jesus. It's not the same one. This one's incorrupt. This one's corrupt. And see, God helps us with the difference. This one gives out a sweet savor before God. And it just smells wonderful. This one stinks like dung in the field. It stinks like rotting corpses. It stinks like nasty food left in the refrigerator. It's corrupt. And we ought to be able to know the difference. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words. Here we stop right here. Here we go. What kind of words? Not corrupt ones with flies all in it and doctrines of devils. Wholesome. Okay, you know what wholesome is, don't you? Wholesome means it's a whole thing. It doesn't have pieces taken out of it. Okay? Wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strife of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Gain is godliness.
Oh, if you'll just, if you'll say this and do this and you'll have enough faith and you'll proclaim this and with positive energy, then God will make you healthy and God will give you success and God will give you money. Because their doctrine says that gain is godliness. You know why? They're men of corrupt minds who consent not to wholesome words. They will not consistently use the King James Bible. From such withdraw thyself. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 8. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Stop right here. Of all the churches now that are following all these new Bibles, Okay? They'll use the NIV, they'll use the New American Standard, they'll use the Message Bible. That's close to probably being the worst one there is. They'll use all these new translations. You will never hear them say, you know what, yeah, we're using these translations, but I'll tell you, if you really want to know what the Word of God says, get a King James Bible out. They don't, they don't say that. They don't say that. They resist the truth. In fact, here's what you hear. They'll, they'll do the opposite. They don't want you turning to the King James Bible. They want you, in fact, they want you just to show up on Sunday, put money in the plate, and look at all the little nice words that they have up on the screen while they tell you what, how to live and what to do. They resist the truth. They are men of corrupt minds, reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. You know what he's saying by that? You want to know whether or not it's corrupt or not? Just take a whiff. Just smell it. See if it passes the test. Just look at it and see what's going on. Just hear it. And see if it sounds... Cr I mean, my wife is the world's best in the world at picking out watermelons at the market. Okay? She goes and you know, the, you know the, the, the sound of a good, fresh watermelon. You thump it. And there's a sound and a feeling that you get. Okay? If it's too dense, which means it's not ripe, okay, then it doesn't sound right. If it's, if it's, if it's already started to rot on the inside... It's, it's mushy, but if it's just right, you flick that thing and you sound it and you're going, that sounds right. This is a good melon. Let's take this one. Are you getting this? If it doesn't sound right, it's probably not right. And God has designed us through the course of our entire life to know and understand what's corrupt and what's not. Dogs don't know. Dogs don't know what's corrupt. They don't care. They'll eat just about anything. Are you getting my point? And so, they shall proceed no further. Their folly shall be manifest in all men as theirs was also. You know what God's going to do? God, one of these days, is going to open up the pantry and He's going to see all the corrupt things. He's going to say, you know what? I'm done. We're going to throw this out. Can't use it anymore. Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. Here we go. Would you listen to this? You know, and before I read this, this is kind of funny because anybody that's involved in any kind of sinful activity that doesn't want to give it up and doesn't want you to say anything about it, they'll, and if you say something about it, they'll say, you're judging me, you're not supposed to judge. They pull like one misrepresented thing out of the Bible, which they won't do it for anything else. And they'll take one misapplied principle out of the scripture and use it against you. You're not supposed to judge me. You're judging me. You're not supposed to judge me. Okay. Let's follow what the Savior said instead of worrying about what they say. All right, Matthew chapter 7, verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Stop right here. Okay? You shall know them by their fruits. Number one, whether it's corrupt or not, remember the watermelon. My wife with the watermelon. Thump, thump, thump. That's a good one. She knows. She knows what's good and she knows what's not good. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs? of thistles. Think about grapes and figs. My grandpa used to have a fig tree and I used to love to go down to his house in, in Jacksonville, Arkansas. He had the most magnificent fig tree. It's the only place I've ever eaten fresh figs. Pull them right off the tree just as they're ripe and eat them and they are absolutely wonderful. I miss eating those fresh figs off. They're sweet 
We have a we have a, a, a fruit around here called persimmons. Okay, persimmons are really they're oh they're the most magnificent fruit. They're very 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 sweet. As long as they're ripe, and they only ripen after the first frost of the year. First frost comes along, you know they're going to ripen very quickly, and you can eat them. Splendid fruit. These persimmons are. If you catch them though before they're ripe, they are the most bitter sour, awful things you've ever had in your mouth. But figs and persimmons and grapes, the sweetness of grapes. And you don't find grapes on thorn trees and you don't find figs on thistles either because they're corrupt. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Now I want to, I want to show you who this is. Okay? I'm going to show you who this is. Let me get down here to Albert Pike. Okay? Here, right here, this King James Bible, is the good tree. It is. It's the tree of life. There's no doubt in my mind about it. Okay? This book literally has saved my soul and it has saved my life. And so I know this to be the good tree. The good fruit of this tree is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get where I'm going? This is the grapes and the figs. Mmm, yummy. This right here is the book of the Antichrist. It's esoteric doctrines re it are, me are meant to conceal the coming of the Antichrist in days, I think, shortly to come. It is a corrupt tree along with these others. And a corrupt, this has thorns in it. Because all through the book of Morals and Dogma, it talks about how acacia is this wonderful wood that has this ancient mystery symbolism to it that's going to bring immortality. You know what acacia is? The Bible calls it shittim trees, thorns. So here is a thorn tree. Here is a good tree. This tree is going to bring forth the fruit of the Lord Jesus Christ. What's this one going to bring? Evil fruit. Think of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The fruit that Eve was not supposed to eat of. That's the evil fruit. And so watch this. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. The King James Bible, and wherever it's preached, it cannot bring forth anything other than the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. But then it says, neither can a corrupt tree. Are you listening to me? New American Standard, NIV, New King James, Book of Mormon. They cannot bring forth good fruit. That's just what the Bible says. A corrupt tree. A tree that has words missing out of it. It's not whole some. Words and phrases and things changed. Whereas this Bible here says that the fourth one in the, in the fiery furnace was the Son of God. It's incorrupted. This one here, the NIV says, it's a son of the gods. That's who this is. A son of the God. How, how simple does this have? I can't make it any more simple than that. This tree cannot bring forth anything but the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. Read it, study it, meditate over it, pray over it, cry and weep over it, hold on to it. I mean like physically go, Lord, I love your word. This tree here cannot bring forth good fruit. This is the words of our Savior, by the way. I have three stories to bring you, okay? Got a little bit of time here, but I have three stories to bring you. This is, uh, people kept sending me this over and over again. This is Ed Young. If you watched our video called The Emerging Church, I think I talked about Ed Young and used a clip of him in that video. Ed Young, well, this guy seems to be preoccupied with this and his preaching. He seems to think that if he just preaches this stuff, by the way, he's into stunts, okay? Publicity. This, that's what this, you'll see it. It's publicity. Okay? Uh, he's trying to get more people into his church. I don't know if they're out of money or what. I mean, I don't know. But anyway, here is, here is Ed Young, who, who earlier, preaching a sermon series on sex, literally says, sex is worship. That's scary. Here's a, here's a uh, news clip. Pastor and his wife hold sex experiment on the rooftop of their church. 
I don't know how many people sent me this from different news agencies all over the country, probably all over the world. This probably went all over the world. Pastor Ed Young and his wife in a bed for 24 hours on top of the roof of their church, calling in the news, the local news people and the national news people to do stories on them, seeing them in bed together because the sermon series that they were going to do was called a sex experiment. And Ed Young coined a phrase. Let's see if I can remember it right. I don't want to mess it up. He said, sex is not x-rated. It's God created. He's wanting to give you the idea that the way to glorify God in your life is to have a lot of sex. So much so that he challenged people with their partners to have sex for seven days in a row. Now, see this? I've read most of what's in this book, so I know what's in it. One of the things that Albert Pike teaches in Morals and Dogma is the theme of what's called the Masonic Ladder. The Masonic Ladder, depending on which volume you read, has either three or seven rungs to it. And these seven rungs represent seven things that you do. And the ladder reaches from earth to heaven. And see, therein lies the, the, the sacred mysteries. We've taught about this many times. You have the, a son of the gods. You have the gods who are in the heavens. And you have Mother Earth. And the two come together in sexual union. That's what like the square and compass and everything in Freemasonry has to do with sexual union. I mean, it's like, it's like the dirtiest religion in the world, okay? And so anyway, the seven rungs are the seven Mithraic rites or the seven ways uh, out of that, that Osiris is going to come out of the pit and rise up. Are you getting this? There are seven kings and all this stuff. By the way, the, the phrase bottomless pit, seven times in the King James Bible, okay? And so anyway, this, you know what Ed Young's teaching? He is removing them from the simplicity in Christ that just says, you know what, if you call upon the Lord, God will save your marriage. God will save this. God will help you with this. God will do things if you just ask him to do. Ed Young is saying, you know, in the ancient mystery, he's not going to say this, but what he's teaching you is, he's teaching you sexual rituals that are meant to invoke God's power in your life. See, it's very subtle, but that's what it is. You say, I don't believe that. Here was what Ed Young <coughs> wrote on his blog concerning this. Make sure you join us this weekend at Fellowship Church as we download the truth about one of the greatest gifts God has given to us. The greatest gift? Sex? Where did he get this idea of him and his wife being in bed? He got it from John Lennon and Yoko Ono. Here we go. Here we go. Evil communications, John Lennon, corrupt good manners. It worked. It worked. So according to Ed Young, sex is one of the greatest gifts that God has given us. Let's, I thought salvation was. If I never had another thing in this world, nothing, and God will save me. I've got everything I need. But here is the true statement. Jude, chapter, verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men, Ed Young, crept in unawares, John Lennon, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you with me on this one? That's what he's done. The corruption is already the corrupt, from the corrupt Bibles, from the corrupt tree is springing forth the corrupt fruit of Ed Young and his wife being in bed, a publicity stunt of all things, trying to get noticed 
trying to get people, put up billboards everywhere with four feet sticking out of the end of the bed. That's what churches all across this country are turning into. Why? They're just eating off the corrupt tree is what they're doing. Let's move next to Rick Warren. You know him, don't you? Okay, you may, might not have ever heard of Ed Young, but you know Rick Warren. 40 days of purpose, the purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven church. Everything do this, do that, and God will do this, and God will release this. Here's a tweet. Somebody sent it to me, and I, I went back and double-checked Rick Warren's Twitter account to make sure that he actually said this. And here's the amazing thing. Okay, and I'm, I'm trying to use some of this technology, and I'm not hip on it yet. I'm not all up the way some other people are. But I'm figuring out that once you tweet something, somebody else can retweet it. Let me show you what Rick Warren tweeted on January 13th, 2012. Rick Warren said, It's neither sinful nor shameful for a man to have feminine qualities or a woman to have masculine ones. You have some of both. And then in the next tweet, he's quoting some kind of scripture. In his own image, God created them both male and female. Now, I'm going to stop right here. Now, I'm going to tell you that I tried, I tried online to search for exactly how this verse was worded in about six or seven different translations. I couldn't find it. So uh, apparently he just made it up or he just wrote his own version of the Bible. See, let me, let me do it here, okay? Here we have a corrupt Bible. This is Rick Warren, what Rick Warren said God said, and this is what God said God said, okay? And so now Rick Warren has this idea. Rick Warren has this idea that if you're a man and you want to act like a woman, yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're a woman, you want to act like a man. Nothing wrong with that as well. God, in fact, God made you that. We see, the Bible says God created them both male and female. Rick Warren said that every person has both male and female qualities inside of them. That's not what God said. And then by giving, by giving this verse here in his own image, you know what he's saying? See, it's official now. It's official. Rick Warren has joined the list of people who believe that God is both male and female. Let me compare what Rick Warren said up against the Word of God, the King James Bible. The King James says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Notice that God did not say, Let us make man and woman in our image. Then he said, So God created man in his, that's masculine, own image, in the image of God created he, him, that's masculine, then, that notice, notice, there's a separation here. Male and female created he, them. But notice that now when finally God adds the word female, he does not say that God created the female in God's image. Only the man. Are you with me? But then Rick Warren says, in his own image, God created them both male and female. He has altered the word of God. He has corrupted the word of God to give people the idea that since God is both male and female, that it's okay for you to be both male and female. And so I was just looking around. I was just looking around at, I was looking at Rick Warren's Twitter account, and I noticed, I typed in those words, and I noticed... I noticed that there was a bunch of people that had retweeted what Rick Warren tweeted. And you know what? I could tell by the picture. You say, well, you're judging people. No, you can tell. I can tell by the picture associated with some of these people's Twitter accounts that they didn't have a problem in the world being both male and female. You know what, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? See, you can spot these people a mile away, okay? It's some guy trying to pose himself off as a woman but it just doesn't sound right and it doesn't look right. And see, we know these things. We know what corruption is. Uh, Kenneth Copeland said this. People have even argued about whether God is male or female. But the Bible itself tells us that he's both. That's right. In the Hebrew language, all words have gender. They're either male or female. But the Hebrew word Jehovah is both masculine and feminine. He's wrong. He is as much female as he is male and as much male as he is female. He says, originally, mankind was that way too. 
When God first made man, he was as much female as he was male. Then God separated the female part out of the made and, and, and out made woman or the man with the womb. I don't know where he gets this stuff. After that, man and woman had to come together to be perfectly whole. Are you, are, are you getting this? This is why Ed Young says, um, if, if, you want, if you want to invoke God now, you want to get the secret power, the male and the female have to come together for seven nights in a row. Kenneth Copeland and Rick Warren, they're saying the exact same thing. You know who we're talking about, don't you? We're talking about what is referred to as a hermaphrodite. Now, in doing the research for this part, see, I've studied, uh, we're going to talk about Baphomet. I've studied Baphomet, but I, I, I didn't go the extra mile. In this study, it came up. There was actually a figure in Roman and Greek mythology called Hermaphroditus. Hermes. Hermes is famous in Freemasonry. Hermes Trismegistus. Hermes Thrice Majestic as the one who holds the secrets. Hermes um, is the one, is the God who has been put down. He's buried, he's hidden, he's concealed, and he's going to be unlocked one of these days. That's Hermes. Aphrodite, and both Hermes and Aphrodite are sex gods. Think of Rob Bell who writes a book called Sex God. That's who Hermes and Aphrodite are. And so Hermes and Aphrodite come together in a sacred union, and the child that they form is called Hermaphroditus. Here is a picture, a painting, a drawing of Hermaphroditus. Hermaphroditus has both male and female parts and wings. Who does that look like to you? The God who is both male and female. That's not the God of the good tree. The God of the good tree is Father, is He. That's who the God of the good tree Bible is. The God of these new corrupt Bibles will lead you to believe the doctrine that he is both male and female, and so that we, in order to be really whole, must be both male and female together. You see, they are turning the grace of God. They're corrupting the grace of God, turning it into lasciviousness. And then, then, let me show you how this works, okay? Uh, somebody sent me this. There was a pastor by the name of Mark Schreiner. Pastors, uh, the United Methodist Church, uh, no, he pastors uh, in St. Charles County, which is not too far from here, about an hour away. He pastors the fastest growing new United Methodist Church start in the state of Missouri and now serves as a model for other new church starts. I want you to get that. Everybody's watching him now. Okay? Got this big hip hop church going. Okay? And he, he made some news because he was encouraging people to tweet while he was preaching. In other words, get their cell phone out and go to do their Twitter thing while he's preaching. And in some cases, he was asking them to tweet him questions that he could answer during his sermon. Now, uh, here a while back, I did a thing on a Wednesday night, and I'll do it again, okay, uh, where I have a question and answer time during the service. Nothing wrong with that, and I used my iPad, and I had people write in with the emails, and I'd get them right up on my iPad, ask me questions about some things in the Bible. We had a great, had a great study, and I'll do it again. So I don't have a problem with that, but here's what got me going. On the questions that they were asking him, and his answers... So one question is, what CD do you own that, you, that no one would suspect? And his answer was, Kiss, Greatest Hits. Uh, Kiss, their album. They call me Dr. Love. Hmm. Uh, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Chocolate with hot fudge and raspberries. Okay, that's not too bad. Uh, what's your scariest moment ever? And he talks about that. Uh, what hands down best concert you've ever attended? This is, this is the people asking... Oh, no, I better do it this way. Asking the pastor, the reverend, the man who's supposed to lead them to salvation in Christ and holy living, what's the best concert you've ever been to, pastor? The Red Rocker Sammy Hagar I Can't Drive 55 tour. Evil communications, but it, it, it's, 
it gets better. Well, it gets worse. What talent do you wish you had, but you just don't? Like, not even close. And he writes, singing. I'd so love to be a Mark Roach for a day. Rock the house! I'm not even close, which is why I sit in the front row so no one can hear me. Mark Roach is the worship leader at this pastor's church, Morning Star. You know, you know where I'm going? Let me show you some corruption. Okay, Morning Star Church. You see, I'm doing this because I I'm just pretty much know that this church will not stand by the King James Bible. And so that means they use this and other translations. In Isaiah chapter 14, uh, verse 12, it says, How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. So he pastors Morning Star Church, and Mark Roach is his music worship leader. Worshiping! We're going to worship God now, okay? And so everybody stands up, puts their hands up in the air, and this guy plays the guitar and the drums and all this. All this is going on, okay? Remember now, evil communications do what? They corrupt good manners. You see, I'm not opposed to guitars playing and keyboard. You see me here, I play a keyboard, and uh, my son plays guitar, my daughter plays a piano. Uh, I don't have a problem with some rhythms. I, I mean, I'm just, I like music. I like, I like some good music, okay? Even a little fast music. It's, you know, God designed us to have rhythms, and so that's, I, there's some things I don't have a problem with. Biblically, I don't have a problem with it, Okay? Um, there are even percussive instruments uh, mentioned in the scripture, the tabret, for one. But here's the problem, okay? If you go back to the, let's say, the folk Christian music scene back in the 60s, okay? Probably didn't have the best start in the world. It came, sort of, a lot of it came out of the hippie generation. But you had some, maybe some reformed hippies actually singing about Jesus, Okay? Uh, that has changed a lot over the years. In the last 40 years, they just sing about you. Some, some you God. I don't know. I don't, you, don't, you don't know who they're talking about. So here's Mark Roach. And I've actually done this several years ago. I actually researched this several years ago. Lost the notes. But I, it dawned on me. It dawned on me a long time ago that there was something that was driving these new contemporary Christian rock and worship bands. There was an unseen force behind the scenes, and most, most of these contemporary rock Christian groups don't have a problem in the world telling you what music they listen to. Mark Roach is no different. Mark Roach writes down Glenn Phillips, Billy Joel. Let me, let me stop right here. Billy Joel, uh, he's a lost man, sings a lot of love songs. Um, he has a song called Only the Good Die Young, where he talks about you Catholic girls start much too late. You know what he's referring to in that song? Okay, He's referring to the fact that Catholic girls are being told by the church to wait till they're married to have sex. And Billy Joel thinks that's a bad idea. He said, yeah, I think you should start earlier. That, that, just, that just sounds creepy to me. So he likes Billy Joel. And then... Told, toad the Wet Sprocket, Coldplay, Passion, and Sonia Dada. Now, I, um, I had to look some of these up. I'd never heard of them before. Okay? Uh, a group called Coldplay. Now, that's, that's not a Christian group. That is a, uh, that's a pagan, devil-worshipping, rock and roll group. Here's one of their songs called The Nappies. This song, boy, I hate to do this. This song, Mark Roach listens to it, deals with a guy dealing with his girlfriend who's been pregnant. It's a weird nine months with you I've had. There is blank going down that you can't disguise. When your blank's gone up ten times in size, your cup's gone up from A to D. It's bad for you, but it's fun for me. And I, I had to stop right there. And not put any more of the lyrics of this song. I, I'm not going to do that here. This worship leader says, 
Oh, yeah, I, that's good music. I like that. And then Sanya Dada. And some of you are going, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know who that is. Here's the lyrics to one of her songs. Yeah, but before I get going, I've got to say, I know you used to love me, but that was yesterday. And the truth, I won't fight it. When the love starts burning, you got to do what's right. But before I get going, I've got to say, there was a time, old woman, when you used to shake it for me. But now all you do is just treat me cold. Ain't going to take it no more. Going to walk out the door. So in other words, according to this song, if you don't, uh, if you don't pleasure me, I'm going to leave you. That's what, uh, that's what the worship leaders are listening to. Toad the Wet Sprocket. I'd never heard of this group, but I actually remember back in the days when I worked in construction, there was a guy that actually sang this song. I didn't know what it was. Never heard of it before. But he was singing this song on the job site. And I'm going, wow. Toad the Wet Sprocket has a song about forcible rape. Take her arms and hold her down until she stops moving. Take her arms and hold her down until she stops kicking. And they don't know her, but what the blank. You see, I'm not just picking on one guy. This is common for what most pastors, most worship leaders, most Christian groups, this is common. This is common, and now it's common amongst church members because rock and roll, I'm not talking about Christian rock and roll music, I'm talking about worldly, wicked, lasciviousness, rock and roll music is not only being allowed, it's being endorsed. Be not deceived. You say, well, you know, I go to that church because I like the music. Where did it come from? Where did it come? It didn't come, it didn't come from the good tree. It came from the corrupt tree. And if it came from the corrupt tree, it will bring forth corrupt fruit. But it will not bring forth good fruit. So these churches are big. They're full. This guy's church, Mor Morning Star Church, wink, wink, okay? Fastest growing startup Methodist church in the state of Missouri, and he's the model now for all these other churches. They say, you got to do it the way he's doing it. You got to get you a good song leader who listens to nasty music. That will inspire him in his music. This is my incorrupt tree. And it produces incorrupt fruit. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We mentioned this earlier, Psalm 16.10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. I, listen, something, something in this world, something in this world has to be incorrupt. At least one Bible in the entire world has to be the incorrupt, pure word of God. Examine the fruit. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do is look for the fruit. There is no Morning Star Church that uses only the King James Bible where the worship leader listens to songs about forcible rape. And says, hey, that's, that's okay. Listen to that. It's fun. I like that kind of music. It's okay. You see, the King James Bible churches are supposed to bring forth the good fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the simplicity in Christ. It's the corrupt trees that are bringing forth the corrupt fruit. Remember, they're going to lead everybody to worshiping another Jesus, receiving another spirit and another gospel, and then, oh, by the way, let's make us an image and worship it and say, these be thy gods, plural, when there is only one, and God would not allow him to see corruption. I, I spend a lot of time in this ministry, not just teaching you um, the, the doctrines that the King James Bible is right, but by proving it to you or trying to prove it to you. 
And I will keep doing that in this ministry until God says, you're done. So if you don't like this, I'm going to annoy you on the next Watchman video broadcast. But if you do, I'll bless you on the next Watchman video broadcast. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.